I stand on the shoulders of giants. I come from a long lineage of this name called Koinange without the privilege. That street you see out there down the road. is not named after me. <laughs> it's named after my grandfather, Senior Chief Koinange, one of the initial architects of the Mau Mau Revolution. Every time I pass down that street, I take pride in that name, and I take credit every time people mention that street's name. I say, yeah, it's named after me. I'm not talking about what happens on that street. <laughs> That's a different story. But nevertheless, Gina Kubwa. So that's how I grew up. My grandfather started the revolution, as I said, with my father and brothers and sisters and grandmothers. And on October 12, 1952, when uh, a state of emergency was declared, they were all detained. My father spent seven years in detention. My grandfather, eight. My father's mother spent another seven. All of them, the entire family, maybe about 26 of them, were detained. Some of them died in detention. That's how I grew up. So my father comes back from detention, marries my mother, has four children, and on March the 7th, 1966, the day I turned two months old, he died. Two months. The eldest in our family, my sister, was four and a half years old. Second born was three and a half, third born was two and a half, I was two months old. My mother was 28 years old. Imagine, three years after independence, 1966, you're 28 years old, your husband dies, you're left with four children. Anyone who's 28 here, think about that for a moment. She was a headmistress in a school in Kiamba, right past Banana Hill. And the one thing that she decided to do after that, and I will forever, ever be grateful, she said she would give us the best education that she could. Um, my brother and I went to St. Mary's, and he finished down at seven, and uh, he wanted to go on to boarding school, which was the thing to do at that time, you know, guys in patch and alliance and changes. That's all people wanted to do is go to boarding school. So he applied and, and was accepted to changes, uh, Lenana. And it was great. It was fantastic when we used to take him to school on Sundays and see the uniforms and the guys and the houses. It was great. And I said, I want to follow him. I want to go to school just like he did. Uh, I want to follow him to changes. At that time, my sisters were in LGS, Limuru Girls School. They called it Chocks then. Uh-huh. So everybody had gone to boarding school, and now the little kid wanted to go to boarding school and leave our mother behind. And that wasn't going to happen. So I stayed in Mary's. And everything I did growing up was because of this woman who, who raised us. I got into sports like John was talking about earlier on, rugby, soccer, basketball, cricket, hockey. I played everything to make this woman proud. I got into... Uh, I was a school prefect uh, all the way up to Form 6 just to make this woman proud. There was one time, I, uh, they had, because I was such an athlete in school, they said, this guy is going to be head boy in this school. He's destined to be head boy. And, and, I, and I knew I was going to be head boy. It was obvious. It was obvious. To cut a long story short, I didn't make it to head boy. So what I decided to do, because... I, I, it really affected me. I was really, really affected by the fact that I didn't make head boy. I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a play. I'm going to write a play that will forever be remembered in this school's history. Now, back then, 1984, St. Mary's never or hardly participated in the school's drama festivals. Remember those ones? School's drama. For the first time, I wrote a play, and the school accepted it, and it was entered into the provincials. It was, then it was the provincials before you went to the nationals. The provincials, that it was the, actually the, tw the silver anniversary of the school's drama festival, 25th year. So the provincials were being held in, uh, at Kenya High at Boma, 
and then the nationals will be held in Nairobi, Taifa Hall down the road. We went to the provincials, we competed against all the schools in the province, and we came third. Usually, only the first two schools would make it through to the nationals. Because it was a silver anniversary, three schools were accepted. So the first, the second, and then us as third were accepted to go to the nationals. The play was, by the way, it was called It's Only a Matter of Time. It was about South Africa before, while it was still under apartheid. Cut a long story short, we performed it in front of a great audience and, and judges at Taifa Hall. And uh, St. Mary's, for the very first time, won the National <laughs> Drama Festival. Yeah, 1984. And it kind of opened my eyes. It, 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 it said to me, you know what, maybe there is something here for you. Maybe you have a gift here for writing and telling stories. I finished high school, 1986, A-levels and everything. Mom had already, you know, uh, spent all her monies educating us, so I didn't get a chance to go to university then. And uh, I started working at a, um, at a bank here in Nairobi. And while working there, six months later, one of my colleagues in the bank showed me a newspaper headline that said, Pan American Airlines, you know, the American airline that everybody knew back then, Pan Am, was hiring flight attendants for the very first time uh, from Africa. And she said, hey, man, let's apply. I said, what the flight attendant? What do you want to do? You want to be, what, a waiter in the air? <laughs> and she said, no, you're going to see the world. This is a great opportunity for you. You're 19 years old. I said, you know what? Okay, why not? We applied, as did 10,000 other people they were looking for 40 people to take to Miami, Florida. Guess what? I made it. <laughs> of those 40, so they, they took us, flew us to uh, Miami, Florida, first time on a, on a plane uh, flying overseas. And it was, I, we arrived in Miami and it was amazing, it was incredible. And when we were on the plane and one of the instructors told me, Jeff, why don't you take the manual, the Pan Am manual, and just announce to the passengers, there are no passengers here, the seats are empty, but just announce about how um, to store your luggage and all that stuff. So I got on the PA system, the public address system, and I said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard Pan American Clipper Flight number 088 from Nairobi, Kenya, with continuing services to Lagos, Monrovia, Dakar, and New York. All of us are trained in cabin safety, and we ask that you watch and listen carefully as we review the safety features of this Pan American Boeing 747. I remember this from 38 years ago. <laughs> so, that's exactly what the instructor did. He said, do that again, man. <laughs> I said, do what again? He said, do that thing again that you just did. I said, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Pan American. And that was it. I discovered that day or that time, the gift was right here in my throat. I had no clue what I was going to do in life. Fast forward, we're working an actual flight. Passengers were flying from Nairobi to New York and we're having a great time. We're young. It was fantastic. We're seeing the world. Seven times out of ten, passengers would say, every time I did the announcement, they'd say, is that a radio announcement there? You know, Americans, you know how they are. It, it, is that a recorded message there? They said, no, it's that guy who's standing up there. They said, call him. We want to talk. Call him back here. After the service, a couple of hours later, I would walk back and they'd say, hey, listen, kid, I was 19. You need to go to school. You need to do something with that voice because one day you're going to make a lot of money with that voice. I'm still waiting to make a lot of money, but that's not... <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Against all odds, I decided, you know what? I'm going to exploit this thing, this one gift that I have. I'm in college. Um, after working for Pan Am, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, a, uh, I'm, I'm in the college. And I, uh, it's graduation time. And uh, they come up to me, the, the professors come up to me and say, hey, Jeff, do you know you have gotten all A's in the last three, four semester, semesters that you've been here, all A's. I said, oh, really? That's great. Dean's List, summa cum laude, all that stuff. And they said, we're thinking of making you the uh, valedictorian of this graduating class. 
wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, what is that? Va- valid de what? What? I had no clue. And they said, yeah, you know, you get to speak to the graduating class of your year, and, uh, but you have to compete. There's uh, like five or six people with a 4.0 GPA, so you have to come in front of the board, talk to them, and give your story. I said, okay, no problem. So we did, about five, six of us, and uh, there was a board sitting just like you guys are here, and we had to explain. And I told them, you know, and I gave my story. And I finished, and I went home in the evening, and I got a call from the college, and they said, you've been selected as the valedictorian of the class of 1989. Fast forward. My first job was in 1991, 32 years ago. My first job, NBC News in America and ABC News, and I worked with the American networks, and it was great, it was fantastic. I was never thinking of coming back home. I always thought the grass was greener on the other side. One day, 1994, I see a story on the air. Uh, Nelson Mandela has been elected president, there's big celebrations in Pretoria, huge celebrations, and the entire world had gathered in South Africa. Not too far from there, a four-hour flight in a place called Rwanda, which nobody could pinpoint on a map, 10,000 people were being killed every single day for 100 days. 10,000 hacked, bombed, killed, shot, grenade, everything, I mean, it was horrible. A million people were killed in a hundred days, and nobody could pinpoint where Rwanda was on the map. I decided right there and then, it's time to go back home. Because if you want to tell the story, or our story, you have to do it yourself. You don't leave it to other people to parachute in and out and then leave at their convenience. You tell it yourself. So I came back, 1995. Started working for Reuters, worked for KTN, did all that stuff. And it was a great, great experience. Um, Along the way, and of course, CNN came calling about five, six years later. But I met some great, incredible people and did some great stories, I think, were great stories, along the way. We're in Ouagadougou. You know where that is? Capital of? Formerly known as? Upper Volta. Thank you. Well done. Give yourself a round of applause then. So when Ouagadougou, the, um, it was then OAU before it became AU, right? Organization of African Unity Summit. And Mandela was flying in. Gaddafi was coming in as well. But Mandela was the big focus because he came in. And we were all gathered around him at the, at the, uh, at the center. And uh, it was a press conference. And my first time to meet Mandela. I remember I did that play back in 1984, right? It's only a matter of time. Mandela has now been released. He's president. It's great. I'm seeing this icon. So he comes in, and, and we're asking questions. BBC guy there, there's us from Reuters, there's AP guys. Everyone's asking questions. And Mandela's, you know, taking questions. He's, he owns the room. I love his presence. So he came to my turn and said, Mr. President, and I asked the question. I don't know what I said. He said, oh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Kenya, Mr. President. I'm, oh, what is your name? I said, Jeff Koinenge. <laughs> he said, oh. I know the name. You come from a line of chiefs. Madiba. Man. From that day on, we were like this, man. Every time I met... (laughs) I'm telling you, you can't make this stuff up. We were like this. Hold that Mandela story for a moment, okay? During our time, you know, my wife and I, our greatest challenge in that time was having a child. I don't know if the machine wasn't working. <laughs> and oh, that's, just, that's just not a nice story. So anyway, my wife and I tried everything. The IVF, the whole shebang, it wouldn't work for the longest time. We'd be invited to friends' houses, there'd be kids in the yard playing, swimming and all that, and it was, you know, it was tough for us having a child. Finally, a friend of ours recommended a clinic in Barcelona in Spain, and um, we finally went there, and sure enough, it happened, and we, our son was born uh, on July the 31st, 2007. He's going to be 15 uh, at the end of this month. Yeah, thank you. So, back to Mandela. Press conference, Pretoria. Every time he would see me, he'd say, Ah, oh, the son of chiefs, how are you? I said, Mr. President, and I'd ask a question, and he's, Oh, have you gotten me a grandson yet? 
I said, Mr. President, man, we're trying. I'm trying. We are trying. He said, do you need some help? This guy spent, what, 27 years in prison? He wants to help me out? So little Mbio is born. Uh, seven, eight months later, we're still in South Africa. I'm getting ready to uh, pack up and come back to Nairobi. And uh, I said, you know what? Let me give the president, ex-former president, let me give the president a call and see if he has time. Because he was older now, right? He was older. His, his schedule was very uh, tight. And they didn't want him to meet too many people. But I called his office and I said, listen, man, it's Jeff. You remember me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell Madiba that we finally have a son? He's eight months old. We're heading back to Nairobi. Can we bring him so that Madiba can bless him? And he said, okay, we'll call you back. He called back and said, tomorrow noon, be at the office in Johannesburg. He said, wow, amazing, okay. We couldn't sleep that night. Was, I mean, it was so, it was exciting. Next day, and they said, okay, be on time because... You say noon, Matiba is there at noon. So we get there about 20 to 12, we're hanging out, we're getting ready. The, the, the Mbio is about eight months old. And uh, as we're getting ready, it's quarter to 10, 10 to 5 to 5 to, the motorcade drives in, three cars, motorcade drives in. And Matiba goes straight to his office and we go in. We ended up taking photos, Matiba was, oh, the best thing. Most of the time, kids will be brought to Madiba because, you know, he met, he, he met all kinds of people in all kinds of ages. And when kids were brought to him, for the most part, they would be screaming, right? Because they don't know who this stranger is. They don't know. They have no clue. My son, when he, when Mandela, when he was put on Mandela's hands, he just went and reached and touched him on the cheek and the chin. I have a photo of it, if you don't believe me. <laughs> and it was like they bonded. Oh, the son of chiefs has arrived. <laughs> Unbelievable. Fast forward, I met the most amazing people along the way, from Oprah Winfrey to Bill Clinton to Muammar Gaddafi to, you know, you name it. it my job took me to those places. And I was able to tell the African story. If you want to read my book, you can buy it. It takes books out, but I'm sorry. That's enough. <laughs> And it was great because I loved what I did. From what I saw back then in 1994 when I was living in New York and, I, and to what I was doing then, I said, you know what? I was put here to do something, to tell the story of my people. And since then, there's some great reporters and great people coming out of Africa from, you know, you see Larry these days. He's doing a fantastic job. Let's give him a round of applause, Larry. Yeah. And there are others as well, you know, BBC and, and, and other networks, Al Jazeera and CGT. And four years ago today, my good friend, our good friend, passed away. Great guy, Bob Colimo, fantastic guy, wonderful one, and loved Kenya, loved Africa, loved his job. First time I met Bob Colimo. I'm at the bench I used to do at, at Fairview back in the day, right? Outdoors by the waterfall, all that stuff. Michael, jo Michael Jordan, Michael Joseph was a regular on that show. So I called him on this day. I said, Michael, let's talk about whatever, uh, uh, Safaricom numbers and all that stuff. And, he, you know, Michael was always cool. He always would agree. So he came over. On this day, he was accompanied by this bold black guy with, uh, like, a, you know, earpiece, of course. He was speaking on his phone. And I said to myself, wow, Michael has really upped his security. <laughs> You know, he's got these guys in black suits and radios in their ears and all that stuff. And I, and I made the joke. I said, hey, Michael, you have secret service these days or what? He ignored me, you know, Michael. You know, he ignored me. We did, oh, and, we, and, and I, as, as the guy sat opposite where we are, and, and I, of course, that's how I knew he was security. He sat right there watching us. <laughs> so we finished the interview, and Michael says, let me introduce you to someone. I said, oh, okay. Security? He says, no, this is uh, Bob Collimore. He works for our office in South Africa for Bodacom, and, um, you know, he's thinking of relocating up to Nairobi. I said, oh, cool. And, you know, shook hands, and that's how I first met Bob. A uh, few months later, breaking news. Michael is stepping down. Guess who's going to be the new CEO? Security. <laughs> So we developed this friendship, and we're always very close. 
and uh, we formed a group uh, of uh, about six or seven of us, and we would meet at different houses every now and then. One day, it was actually June the 29th, 2019, right? June 29th. I was having lunch with mom and, and my sisters, and I got a call. Bob said, hey, Jeff, where are you? I said, I'm having lunch with my mom and sisters. He says, do you have a moment? Can you come over? I said, really? I'm having lunch. I, does, can it wait? He says, no. When Bob said no, he meant no. So I left my mom and sisters, went over to his house, and the other boys had all arrived, and Bob said, guys, I have about a month left to live. I just want you guys to let you know. Oh, by the way, when we, when we went to his house, I'm the one who would serve, because I was the youngest in the group, right? I'm the one who served the whiskeys and the wines and all that stuff. This time he insisted on serving everyone, took out wine glass, whiskey glasses, and he took out a bottle of very rare whiskey and he served all of us. Even though some of us don't drink whiskey, but that's another story. And he said, toast to life, because I don't have much to live. And it all shocked us all. You know, we knew he was going through a hard time. He had cancer and everything, but we didn't know it was so, it had accelerated so much. We finished. Everyone went back to their business. I went back to lunch with mom and the sisters. And uh, that was a Saturday. Two days later, July the 1st, 2019, is when we heard the news in the morning that he had passed away. Life is short, folks. Life is short. Live it for every moment it's worth because you just never know. You just never know. And live it to the fullest. Whatever your talents are, whatever you think you're good at, do it. Don't let anybody discourage you. Don't let anybody put you down. Whatever that man up there has given you as your gift, use that gift. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>